Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I'm going to help you figure out how you could find a safe accommodation to heal in. So whether you've been exposed to mold in your current in your current environment, in a previous house, in a work environment, whatever it is, I'm going to try and help you figure out how you can either find or create a safe environment for you to heal in. Anytime someone comes to work with me and they tell me, look, I've got mold illness, I, I, I want your help, I want your coaching, like, give me some support. It is a prerequisite to work with me that they're in a clean environment. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is your biggest like value for money or value for effort invested in your healing process of recovering from mold is being in a clean environment. If you're trying to heal from mold and you're still being exposed to mold, you're literally fighting an uphill battle. And the, the most time, effort, and cost efficient thing to do is change this from an uphill battle to a downhill battle, which means changing, changing your exposure, ex changing your exposure, making it so that you're, you're not being exposed. And I think most people know that, but the practicality of, a, of that situation is challenging. Like a lot of people struggle with this. I struggle with this. The first house I moved into out of living in my primarily very moldy house also had mold in it. So I get, I get it. And when I, when I tell people like you, you have to do this, like you can't play victim. You have to change, you have to change your circumstances. People say, but it's hard, but I don't like it. There's a housing crisis. I don't know how to do this. Like, what, what do I do? I get it. I've been, I've been there. I've done it. Like I really, truly understand. So I want to try and help you with, with, with that today. I'm going to help pre present some solutions. How to find safe accommodation. First of all, this is a numbers game. You, this is like, this is like finding your soulmate, right? Or this is like dating and trying to find a compatible partner. Your environment that you're going to live in needs to be compatible with you. Do you think that you're just going to try one house and you're going to just, oh look, bang, it's perfect. Like the chances of that happening are like ridiculously low. And if you think that's going to happen to you, you're probably living in a fairyland. Like that's just not going to happen. It's a numbers game. You have to look at property after property after property. You have to try, you know, how many dates do you have to go on to find somebody that's a perfect match for you? to be in a long-term relationship, in, in long-term relationship with, you know, the number, like the rough, a rough estimate number is usually between 100 and 400 dates. And if you're going to try and find a compatible house, maybe you're going to be slightly more lucky than that, but you're still going to be having to, to see or view 50, hundred houses, at least a, a minimum to find something that's going to be suitable for you. So number, number one, it's a numbers game. And if you've only tried like one or two, like, and I'm really serious, like think about the numbers, how many accommodations have you looked at? If it's less than 10, you haven't looked at enough. You're like statistically, like, I think it's like one in every, I think it's four, four out of 10 houses are safe. So you've got like a 40% chance of finding a good house. Unless you've looked at like 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 houses. And I know that takes effort and I know that takes energy, but and I know it's hard, but do you know what's harder? It's harder to stay sick. So if you can't do it yourself, like get support from somewhere, like find some help. You must have something somewhere, like leverage some of your resources. You you are a resourceful being, like you can, you can find a way. You, the universe will conspire to help you if you set your intention and try to figure it out. So first of all, it's a numbers game. Um, secondly, you can look, you can try some different things. So personally, I've been traveling a little bit over the last couple of months. So I visited, so I've been to the UK, I've been to Portugal. Portugal is, is on the coast, where I lived is on the coast, so it's mold, notoriously uh, moldy. I spent time in, in Thailand, which has extreme humidity. I've stayed in the mountains, which is humid, and I stayed on the coast, which is even more humid, and coastal things are, are more likely to, to, have, to have mold. I have managed to dodge and avoid mold on, in all of these accommodations. So I've stayed in four or five hotels, I've stayed in maybe four or five Airbnbs. I've stayed in some, some apartments as well. I've, I've been in a lot of different places and I've managed to avoid it in all, in all of these, all of these situations. And so point one is a numbers game. You know, if you find somewhere that doesn't work for you, don't, don't just accept it. Say like, no, this isn't good enough for me. I'm going to find something better. When we went to Thailand, the first place we stayed in, it didn't have mold, but it wasn't really our vibe. It wasn't the right environment for us. I'm more prone to just accept things, but my wife is very like, no, this is not good enough. And it was like distressing for her. Let's say her standards are a little bit higher than mine. So then this is one of the things that I like in her. So we, we contact, so we were staying with Airbnb. We contact them and said, 
this is not what we thought it was. This is not how it looks in the pictures. We sent them like our pictures and so that they could compare the discrepancy of what was advertised to us versus what we got. And we said, We've, we, we want to leave and we want a refund and, and we got it. But if you're just going to accept what's given, what, like your first option, then you're just going to, you're just going to have to live with that. And if that's something that's like, say you do an Airbnb booking and you get something that's moldy and you just say, oh, well, I've booked it. Like that's what you're going to get. But we had, so the second place we went to, there, were water, there was water damage all over the doors. So like you see the door here, it was in the, in the washroom. Like this bottom corner here in both of the washrooms was all water damaged and basically filled with, filled with mold. So we took pictures of it. We left immediately. We submitted this to Airbnb and said, like, this is a health hazard. This is not as, as it was described. We could see the pictures in the photos that they included, no water damage. We sent them the pictures and we said, we have not even stayed one night. We left immediately and we found another accommodation. It's like, do you think I wanted to do that? We just traveled, like we just travel in an airplane. We're tired, we have big suitcases. Do you really think I wanted to be saying, like creating this big mess, finding another accommodation? Like we found another Airbnb that was honestly a little bit more expensive, but it looked a lot, a lot cleaner and safer for us. And we just booked it on the spot before we'd even received the refund from, from the first one. Because we were saying like, this is not acceptable. We will not stand for this. So we just took that leap of faith. We jumped and we just went to the new accommodation and we, we had a dispute. We went back and forth. They said, because you canceled so late, we're not going to give you the refund. And we just pushed it and pushed it and pushed it and said, this is not acceptable. We didn't even stay one night and we fought it. And that's the opposite of, of victim energy, by the way, victim energy is just, I'll just lay down and let whatever's going to happen, happen to me. I, we fought for this. Like we fought, we fought Airbnb. We fought the host. We got a full refund and everything was fine. And we got the new accommodation. And again, not, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't exactly what we wanted, but it didn't have mold and we were, we were okay with that. So if you're, if you're going to look for a long time, long time rental, you have to go and like investigate. It's a numbers game. If you're going to do it on Airbnb, if it doesn't look like what you booked, complain about it, like say something about it. Don't just accept it. Don't just roll over, like fight it, fight it. Like take, take what you want, take what you need. If it's not good enough for you, then don't accept it. Push for, push for what you need. So Airbnb is a really nice option because you've got a little bit more flexibility. Yes, it can be more expensive, but if you do a, like a month long rental or, or longer, usually they'll give you like a 40% discount on your total booking. So that's also something to look at. We've stayed at, stayed at Airbnbs for the last, I would say, three months and we're staying in Airbnbs for the next two months as well. So it's a really nice option. And if it doesn't match the pictures, say something, don't accept it. If you're looking for a more long-term uh, accommodation, my, my biggest suggestion would be it, it's a numbers game and go in the buildings and see how you feel. Like if you're sensitive, like I'm a canary, like I know when I'm being exposed to mold. I don't have like a massive meltdown anymore, but I can feel it. Like I can smell it. I know I can feel it in my body. Go and investigate different different places and see what your body says see this is okay for me this is not okay for me um and and see how you feel if you don't think you can trust yourself get a mold dog mold dogs are amazing like i think that because i recommend this uh like a lot of people think that it's like a stupid idea or like that dogs aren't like smart enough or it's not reliable enough i would trust a mold dog over like an ermy test a hurts me test air samples i would trust a mold dog over any of those things a dog's nose is so sensitive. Like there's a reason that in airports they use them and they train them to, to, to sniff for drugs because they are just as, if not more effective than all of the like logical and scientific screening that they do. They are extremely effective. They are trained to perceive mold and they, 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 they will, they will, they will be able to find it. Like they will know. Not only will they know if the house has, has it, they will be able to identify it. Like you've probably seen bloodhounds. They can track things down. Like they can smell their way to the source of the mold and you can find it. Something that I will say that might clear things up for a couple of people, just because you've got like a bit of mold on a windowsill or you've got like, eat, you could even have mold on the wall, right? That doesn't mean it's not suitable accommodation if it's due to humidity. A lot of houses when they're not, um, when they're not, inhabited or they're not they're, they're not being taken care of correctly the humidity imbalances will cause mold to grow this doesn't mean this is an unsafe building it just means it needs to be taken better care of what you're really trying to avoid when we're looking at like a like a moldy building a water damaged building is you've had some kind of leak like a leak in the roof or a leak from a pipe or some kind of um some kind of like structural damage that has caused that basically meant that the house was unhealthy. 
This can also be caused by like some construction problems. Like if the ventilation in the building isn't correct, or if you've got, um, I had one client that had a beam in the house that was based on the way that the, the house was designed. It was like cooler than the rest of the house. Like it was connected to outside and all of the, all of the water in the house would condense on that single beam and it, and then mold grew, grew all over it. Cause it was a, a problem with, with the building. These are the kind of things that mean a house isn't suitable for you. If it's like, so when, when, when I was staying in Portugal, in the, the first house that I stayed in Portugal, we had no water damage, nothing like this. But we had these really big thick curtains up against the wall. Like near this, it was like a, so in Portugal, usually you have like, almost like conservatory doors, you know, like these big glass doors that like slide. And we had these, and mold grew up in the corner of one of them. But it was just a humidity thing, you know, there was no leak, there was no water damage. It was literally just, the humidity from us heating the house and it being cooler outside and that wall was the coolest wall on the house like it was exposed to the outside so that's what would get coolest fast for like first and because of the the sliding doors the moisture was all pulled towards that and we grew mold all over the wall and i had like a big panic and a big meltdown i was like oh my god we have to find somewhere else to live it's not safe blah. like and that, that that's like a normal thing that you'll desensitize yourself through your work you'll 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 help your nervous system heal through things like that but basically, this was just like wipe it down, clean it, clean it off. Obviously, my, my wife helped me do this because she's less sensitive than, than I am. So again, employ your resources. Use some, like get someone to help you that is less sensitive to you, less sensitive to it than, than you are. Could be friends, could be family, could be anything. So wiped it down. We bought a dehumidifier and we got this like, it was a passive dehumidifier. So it's like this rock inside a little plastic thing. And any excess humidity after a certain point just goes into that. So it changed it so that the humidity, instead of going on the wall and then creating mold, just went into this little thing. And we didn't have a mold problem anymore. And we never had any mold there, there ever since. So just because a house has mold doesn't mean it's an unsuitable environment. It's really like water damage, leaks, and unhealthy buildings that you need to be avoiding. If it does have some mold, yes. If you're extremely sensitive, it's probably not going to work for you. Because when you have mold, it will produce mycotoxins that will embed themselves in all of the porous materials. So it will go in the wallpaper, it will go in the clothes, um, books, fabrics, mattresses, fans of computers and refrigerators and things like that. But the a lot of people will tolerate those and they, they'll be okay. You know, if you're at the point where you've got symptoms under control, you're not in 24-7 mass cell flares, you're not in this constant like one tiny fraction of an exposure sends you like on a, in an avalanche of, of, of hell of symptoms. You'll tolerate, like if you've got a little bit, so I've got the window over there. If you've got a little bit of mold on the, on the windowsill, like that's normal. It's a humidity problem. Get a dehumidifier, wipe it up, clean it. If you've got some mold on the wall, like clean it, get a dehumidifier. If it's a humidity problem, just take care of the humidity problem and you won't have a mold issue. Wherever you're going to have mold, it is some kind of dead material plus water, you will have mold growth universally. That's always what it is. If you can take the water out of the situation, you have no problem. So if you can remove the humidity, that will fix, that will, that will fix things. So a lot of, a lot of water damage, a lot of buildings that people consider uninhabitable are actually perfectly habitable. You just need to manage the humidity better. A lot of buildings aren't designed with humidity in mind. So you do just have to be extra careful with making sure that you are doing it yourself. So dehumidifier, like if you're going to, if you've got mold exposure, you probably have an air filter. You're probably using an air filter to take mycotoxins out of the air. Most of these air filters have dehumidifiers in them. So use it. So we've got some questions here. Teresa, nice to see you, Teresa. She says, where do you find a mold dog? I'd just go on Google and type mold dog near me and see if you find anything come up. Most big cities will have one. Most of them will, uh, most of them will travel as well. So they will travel like four or five hours if they have to. They may charge you for it, but I think you'd find that it's still cheaper than trying to do conventional testing. And I would, I would personally trust it more. I would, I would trust a, a mold dog more. Um, she, and she said, what was the rock that you used for mold? I don't know. It's something that my wife bought when we were in Portugal. So it was in Portuguese. I'm not sure, but you can just type passive dehumidifier. It basically works without electricity. So you could go on Amazon or something and type passive dehumidifier and you'll, you'll, you'll find it. It's usually just like a little plastic tub with like a rock or something, something in it. Uh, Sue here says, how long does it take to heal from mold? That's different for everyone. Um, it's not a, it's not a, it's not, it's a non-linear process. So it doesn't just go like this. It's like, <laughs> it's like this. I'd say the biggest factors are going to be, are you still being exposed? Have you found a clean environment? So that's exactly why I'm making this video because this is the number one most important thing that you do if you want to heal. 
I'd say if you're still not in a clean environment, potentially it could you could never heal. Like I do see it, people get stuck for a really, really long time. Um, not to say you can't remediate and you can't do things. You can. We'll, I'll cover that in a moment. But upper limit could be forever. You, I honestly think most people can feel significantly better in three months if you actually know what you're doing. If you implement the correct changes according to what your body is asking for, you, re, you remove the exposure and you support your body at the point of dysfunction. You can. I literally have case study after case study of clients, 60 to 80% better in three months. This is managed, this isn't healed. So symptoms are managed, but this still means massive, massive improvements in your quality of life. Very, very possible. But it depends for everyone. Obviously not everyone can do that. It took me a long time, but I was exposed for a long time and I was still being exposed for a long time while I was trying to do my recovery. But again, that's why I'm making this video. This is really important. So if you're gonna remediate, which is possible. I also ha I also have a plethora of people I could pull out of my head that have recovered while being in buildings that were moldy and have been remediated. My biggest tips for remedi remediation would be, please don't be in the house while they're doing remediation. Even if they're taking the most care, just don't be in the house. You know, you don't need, just don't risk it. It's not worth it. When they're remediating, they should be creating a negative pressure environment. This means... If they're doing if they're doing a mold remediation and you don't if you don't have a negative pressure environment all of the so it's not the mold itself is not the worst part it's not good okay but it's not the worst part the worst part is the mycotoxins mycotoxins are tiny they're a hundred times smaller than mold spores they are so small that they are unaffected by gravity they can float around in the air indefinitely and the thing that is the worst about them is because they are so tiny they will embed themselves in every single porous material that they meet so they'll go into the wallpaper and then if you do this mycotoxins are just flying out they're doing clothes and you do this or you get your sheet and you put them on your bed mycotoxins everywhere you get a book i remember i had a book that i had from my moldy house and i was recovering i was doing great and i flipped through it it was actually the gaps diet book and i flipped through it and all the mycotoxins just flew out in my face and i just had this like immediate histamine response as they all just flew all over my face so any of these porous materials will be full of of mycotoxins so it's really important negative pressure environment otherwise when they're disrupting all of these things and they're breaking the timber and they're removing the drywall all these mycotoxins that get removed they're just going to fly all the way through your house and you're going to get home and you're going to have a massive flare-up it's not going to work so negative pressure environment means all of these toxins that are being removed are being disturbed the pressure is pulling them out not through the rest of your house out and usually ideally into a filter so that they're not even exposed into the into the air so that's really really important then that room is going to be it's probably going to have very high concentration of um of mycotoxins so you're going to want to ideally use a vacuum or this is what the mold remediation company should be doing is you're going to want to have a a hoover or a vacuum cleaner of some sort that has a hepa filter on it and the air is not redistributed so most hoovers the way they work is you've got the outside stuff the outside material so you're hoovering a carpet it sucks all of the dirt from it. It goes to the filter. The filter takes some of the some of the like the crap, like what you're trying to clean, and holds it on that side of the filter. And then the rest of the air is like distributed back into the air. The thing is, if you're doing this with with mycotoxins, you're just going to suck them through and then put the mycotoxins back in the air because they're so small, the filter doesn't grab them. So you need to use a specific vacuum cleaner that has a 0.1 micron filter or or smaller. Otherwise, you're just going to take those mycotoxins and fly them back into the environment, just recirculate them and make yourself feel really bad. And ideally, also, you want to make it so that you're using a vacuum cleaner. This is what, again, what the mold people should be doing. You have a vacuum cleaner that isn't just pumping this air back into the room. It should be pumping it outside, but after it's been through one of these filters first to try and remove as much of the toxins as possible. We want to stop this stuff recirculating around in the room. Otherwise, you suck it out of the carpet and then it goes into the bed. And then when you clean the bed, you suck it out of the bed and it goes back into the carpet. And then you're just moving the toxins around. And the toxins are only going to leave the room in one of a few ways. Either they're going to leave through your body. You're going to have to take them out of the environment and detox them. They leave out the window or through some kind of filter or something. Or maybe this is even sinister. They're going to leave through your pets, through your family, through your kids. You know, you don't want that. So make sure that they're leaving through... The, the best options, which is from filtering them out and like vacuuming them out and through the windows. Otherwise, they're going out through you or your friends, family, children, pets. Uh, that sucks. You don't want that. 
Question here from Mikhail. How do you deal with mold in the bathroom since you can't get the humidity low? You can, you can get the humidity low. It just means run a dehumidifier while you're having a shower or while you're having a hot bath. Humidity itself isn't the problem. It's when the humidity is persistent. So if you want to have a real, like I would like to have my hot baths, you know, I could do a one hour hot bath, you know, like scorching, like burn myself red. And there's moisture everywhere and it settles on the wall, it settles on the mirror, on all the surfaces. That's fine, that's not a problem. It's a problem if that happens and then you leave it there and then it just impregnates into the into the into the wall and then mold will start to, to grow to to break that material down that's wet. After you get out of the shower, after you get out of this hot steamy shower, after you finish the bath, get a, a dehumidifier that is that is powerful enough for what you're trying to achieve. You should be able to get a dehumidifier that you can leave in that room and within an hour of it running, you can bring the humidity level down to a point where all of the condensation that's on the walls has completely disappeared. On the mirrors, on the glass, like even around the edges of the shower, all of that should evaporate and then get pulled into the dehumidifier. If that isn't happening, your dehumidifier is not powerful enough. It's not actually doing its job correctly. And if you're trying to rely on those, you know, like in most bathrooms, like you turn the light on or you've got a thing and it's like this extractor fan on the wall or like in the ceiling, they are not good enough. What I have never seen one of those that is actually like good enough at, at doing that. Get a dehumidifier, like a proper dehumidifier. That will resolve most of those issues. If you start to get mold, like in the in the creases of your shower, you know, like in between the tiles and things like that. When, if that if that grouting is going moldy, that means that it's not working anymore. These are supposed to be watertight seals. If they've started to go moldy, they're not watertight anymore, and you need to change them immediately. So this means, again, just just hire someone to do it. Don't do it yourself. Like get somebody goes to school and they spend years training on how to do this perfectly. And yes, it costs a little bit more money, but. You don't want to like ruin your house you know you don't want to like fuck up the seal around the the bathtub and then end up having mold all the way underneath it just pay someone that actually knows what they're doing to do this properly just say look all the grouting is like just change it they will go around all the seals around the back of your sink around the bathtub around the shower they will remove it correctly they will properly scrape it all out if you have mold in it it's already not working so that means not only is the grouting going moldy, but the, there's probably water going down the sides as well, which is very, very bad. So if, you're, if your silicone sealant is, is looking black, like that's a really big red flag. Pay someone, get them to scrape it all out, lay a new one, and don't use the room for a couple of, I think you need to leave it for like 48 hours. Do not get it wet. Let it seal properly. And eventually it is going to get moldy because it's a shower like you have water in that room like it's normal and it's okay you just need to take care of it and this maintenance looks like yeah maybe you have to get it replaced every three months every six months or if you can be bothered go and wipe it down after every single time you have a shower i can't be bothered to do that like i have more important things to do so i'll just pay someone to come and fix it so that it's it's functioning correctly anyway you've got water and dead material, you will get mold. So the easy thing you can do is remove that water component. Dehumidifiers will really, really help. Even the, so this sealant situation, so this works on the sides of windows, this works in the bathroom, like on the, on the edges. If these things are getting wet, if you have a dehumidifier in the room and the humidity of the room gets low enough, all of the moisture that is on the different surfaces, including on these seals, will evaporate. It will go into the air and then it will also be filtered out through the dehumidifier. So if you're still having these condensation problems in on your windows or in, in the washroom, you have a humidity problem, your dehumidifier isn't powerful enough. And maybe you need to get a stronger one or maybe you need to get more. As far as, so back, back to this remediation topic, everything that was in this room that has, that has had mold exposure, Ideally, you want it to be vacuumed in the way that I described previously. You can also try fogging. I don't know as much about fogging as maybe I should. I would never remediated, so I don't have first-hand experience with this. But as I understand it, it's going to help to collect any of these microtoxins that are still floating around in the air, makes them heavy so they fall down and they can be cleaned up, hoovered more, more easily. I don't have experience with it, but this is what I've read is, is an important step as well. So negative pressure environment remove remove the the water damaged materials and actually fix the root cause you know if you have a leak in the ceiling fix the leak if you have a leak at the back of the sink fix the leak otherwise it's all going to come back so fix like just as with healing you know root cause focus fix the root cause find the leak find the source of water that's always what it is there's always water 
If it's a humidity thing, fix the humidity. Whatever it is, fix the water problem. Remove the damaged materials um, in a negative pressure environment. Do the fogging and use this vacuum cleaner that has a 0.1 micron HEPA filter on all of your porous materials. This is books. This is um, this is clothing. Like this is even things you wouldn't think about. Like on my microphone here, this this little thing. It's it would be full. This would be full of mycotoxins. Like anything that's porous, anything that's spongy. A mouse, oh, there's a mouse mat in front of me here. Could be that. You know, I've got a glasses case. This is a soft material. This is full. This would be full of mycotoxins. So it's all of these things. It's books. It's documents. It's pieces of paper. It can be pictures. Anything that has a fan. So computers. Like take your computers to be professionally cleaned. If you're going to move them from a, a say this was in your basement and you have a computer running in your basement or you have a refrigerator running in your basement. You need to change those things. Otherwise, as soon as you finish remediation, it's just going to pump mycotoxins back out into the whole room. And you're going to go in there and you're going to say, I still feel really bad. I don't think the remediation worked. We have a problem. So you have to do it properly. You have to figure out all these sources. And the best thing you can do is, like, if you can, so again, porous material, if you can throw it away, throw it away. That way you're completely avoiding any potential re-exposure. I know how impractical that is, and I know you probably don't want to throw away your, fair, your family heirlooms and all of your children's pictures and drawings and things like that. Okay, so for a time while your body's healing, just get them out of the environment. Even if you seal them in a, in a vacuum and then leave them in the garage, or you put them in a storage somewhere, or you put them in one of your friends or family's house, like just give yourself some time to not be exposed. I could get that book, you know, that I told, told you earlier, I had the GAPS book, and I flicked it open, and it put mycotoxins all over my face, I had immediate histamine reaction. I could do that to myself now, and I would feel nothing. I would feel no reaction at all, because my body has space to handle extra toxins. It's it's strong again, and it, and the, the response is a calibrated response. I could handle that with absolutely no reaction. But, but the reason that I can do that is I've had consistently no exposure for an extended period of time, and it's let my body get over this hump where it's now able to handle extra exposure. So if, you, if, you, if you're going to prefer to move or leave, and I totally understand it, that was, that was, that was my thought process. I, with the, the severity of my symptoms and how much anxiety and how much of a, an emotional component I had attached to the situation, I knew that living in an environment that I thought could potentially be making me sick was going to be enough to keep me in such a sympathetic nervous system state where I wouldn't be able to enter a healing energy. So for me, it was throw everything away. I literally packed up my whole life in a suitcase and moved to Portugal. And yes, I had a lot of support to be able to do that. And I was very fortunate, but I did, I packed in literally a small sized suitcase, every, everything that I needed. So which was like some supplements. It was actually an inflatable bathtub. So I needed that for my, for my Epsom salt baths. And like a handful of clothes, which when I got there, I got rid of and got new clothes to completely re reduce my exposures. And then in a, in a clean environment, I, for, in, a, in a way, like I'm kind of lucky that this happened to me at a younger age. Like I don't have many things. I'm not particularly sentimental. So like, I don't really care too much about photos. Like any photos that I want, they're important. I have on my phone. Um, so I didn't really le leave anything behind. I didn't really have anything to lose. And being like young and like at the time, unattached, no, no commitments. I could just like up and leave in a way was very, very fortunate. I was able to just make a very clean break, but I will say convenient or not, I will attribute an enormous amount of weight on my ability to do that. So that clean break, I think is why I was able to make such a, let's say a swift recovery. It didn't, it did not feel swift. It felt like the most torturous enduring process that I've ever experienced in my whole life. But when I compare my recovery to some people that I know's recovery, it was extremely, extremely fast. And I will attribute a large uh, component of that to being able to make such a clean break and completely cut my, my exposures. So biggest takeaways from today is a numbers game. If you want to find somewhere that's clean and that is safe, you can find somewhere. You're just going to have to, you're just going to have to be resourceful. And that is the energy that is the opposing energy of, of the victim. The victim says, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, it's not my problem or there is just simply no solution. Like bad things just happen and that's just going to happen to me and I can't do anything about it. 
the the more adaptive response is like shit happens but shit happens to everyone and i'm not going to be one of these people that gets victimized i'm going to do something about it there must be at least one house on the whole fucking planet earth that i can live in that's safe and i'm going to find it it's that kind of dedication that is what fuels healing so find that inside of yourself it exists i i it took me a long time to find it in myself but it's helped me heal ever since i found it so get find that dedication inside of yourself and find somewhere that you can live that's going to help you heal you are resourceful beyond what you could imagine i i i know it i know it because i have personally been a person that was very incompetent very incapable um very unable to like do things like couldn't do things with my hands couldn't like make changes couldn't make decisions impotent and powerless and i dug myself out of this hole so if i've done it i know that you can do it as well and i'm I think it can be triggering when I say this sometimes, but I'm not I'm not just saying like, it's all your fault, like it's all your responsibility and you have to change the situation tomorrow, you know? I lived in mold knowing that I had mold and knowing how bad mold was for four years before I was able to make my escape. So I'm not just saying like, click your fingers, it's an easy thing, just go and do it. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, it is your responsibility to figure this situation out whether you like it or not, like you can pretend that it's not your responsibility, but the only person this is affecting, well, I mean, it does affect other people, but the person that this situation affects the most is you. It's your life. You're the one that's going to have to live it. So you can decide, do you want to take responsibility for the situation and try to like educate yourself, try to become uh, adaptable and try to find like that resourcefulness inside of yourself and change your situation? Or do you just want to like leave it as it is? And I know you're going to say, oh yeah, but it's really hard. I, I know, but staying sick is really hard as well. And I know because I was really, really sick and it was shit. Like it really sucked. I know how hard that was. I will choose this hard every single day because yeah, it is. It's still hard. It's still a lot of effort. It's still a lot of work. It requires a lot of self, self introspection. It requires a lot of growth. It's, it's challenging in a different way, but I'll choose this over that because this is a life that I would, I would rather, I would rather have. So whatever it is that you decide, like whatever the next step is for you, be resourceful and jump like take that take that take that leap take that step i'd never left england before i decided to come and live well i say come and live here i'm not in i'm not in portugal right now i'm in germany but decided to go and leave and go and live in in portugal it was like a big jump it was a big leap of faith but um, i would I, I i i just i kind of didn't even believe i had the resourcefulness inside of me at that time i just did it it was like i was like just i have to do something and no one's going to save me. I have to save myself. Like, and that's, that's the, that's the, that antidote to that, to that victim mentality is like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to try. I'm just going to make a jump. So go and see some houses, go and look on Airbnb, go and find, go and find something. Like I personally, I believe that we live in a reality where a problem cannot exist without a solution. This is part of the dynamic of duality. So you think about the yin yang, the yin cannot exist without the yang. If you have a problem, this is the yin, the yang, the solution is the, is not only it, like the prerequisite of the solution being created is that the problem exists. So if you have a problem, the solution itself also exists. Whatever it is that you're looking for, like the clean environment, the financial support, the like whatever it is that you need, the fact that you have that as a problem right now means the solution is there. But I guarantee you, you're not going to find it if you if you don't go and look for it. If you don't try and find your resourcefulness, if you don't take that jump, that leap of faith, and and do something. It's not just going to come up and like, like knock you on the back of the head and say like, hello, here I am. Like you have to go and find it. You have to find it inside of yourself, that resourcefulness to go out and, and go and look for it. So whatever it is, go and do it. Like go and jump, go and take that next step. I promise you, I'm, 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 I am a hundred percent certain that there is a safe accommodation with your name on it, waiting for you to actually like go and find it. And when you find it, you know, like everything will change. Like that's the, that's the, that's the linchpin. That's the tipping point. I, and I see it over and over and over again. It's the tipping point. As I, and as I said, it is a prerequisite that you are in a clean environment to work with me one-to-one. -one. That shows you how important it is. Cause I only want to work with people that I know are going to heal. And I just know it just doesn't happen. If you're staying in the environment that you got sick, you'll stay sick. It, 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 you can change the environment you can remediate i'm not i'm not saying that you can remediate but that is changing your environment so it's a different environment so don't just stay where you are do something like change something and be resourceful be adaptable like find it within yourself because it exists i promise you it's that i hope that's really helpful if you have any questions let me know remediation is not my strong point because i didn't remediate as i said i just like up and left 
but I have worked with many people that have remediated. So if you have any questions about remedi remediation, about finding a safe location, about anything, about anything that I talked about today, just leave me a comment. If it's like a bit private, you don't want to like post it on a in a public group or something, shoot me over a DM. Just like you can click my my thingy and um, send me a message or shoot me an email. Support at WilliamDickinson.co.uk. You can find healing. I I believe it. Like I found it. I'm not special. You can do it too. So good luck. Not that you need it. You've got this. If you have any questions, let me know. Take care. See you in the next one. Bye bye.